Hello everyone and welcome back to Average Nerd Talks. Now in the previous video, we talked about a few alternatives to using Windows on your computer, one of them being Linux Mint. Now I figured I'll probably give you a demonstration on what it's like to use Linux for you know common tasks on a day-to-day -day basis, as I'm sure many of you have probably not used Linux before or have some misconceptions that you know Linux is really hard to use or Linux Mint in specifically in this case is hard to use. So let's jump right into it. So right off the bat, this video is going to be a little bit different. Um, I'm going to be screen sharing and talking over it. So uh, if you haven't downloaded Linux Mint yet, the first thing you have to do is go to linuxmint.com or you can just look for Linux Mint on Google or your favorite search engine and you should be able to find the website. Uh, you click on the download button and so I know a lot of people recommend you just download the Cinnamon Edition and be done with it. But um, the Cinnamon Edition as of now, as it stands right now, is a bit old. So what I would recommend is you scroll down and you download the Cinnamon Edition, Cinnamon Edge ISO. You can probably just click any mirror out here. So like I'll just click any one of these and then it should download to your computer. It should download an ISO file. The next thing you do is you click on the... Uh, installation guide and what we want here is uh, create the bootable media now this actually gives you um, enough information on how to create your bootable media so if you're running windows which i'm assuming you probably are either windows or mac or anything uh, you should probably follow these steps here now the next thing you have to do is boot from your flash drive now i'm not going to cover that because that changes um from computer to computer. So your computer may have a different way in which you can boot from a flash drive. You should probably look that up, how to boot from a flash drive for whatever computer you have. Once you boot from your flash drive, you're probably gonna be greeted by something like this. And now here, we're just gonna hit start Linux Mint. And there you go. Once you boot from your flash drive and you hit you know, start Linux Mint, this is pretty much what you're gonna get. Now this, I mean, this looks like a usable desktop. It is actually a usable desktop. Now, um, I, I want to change the resolution of this. So you just right click here and click display settings. And I want to change this to, you know, something reasonable like uh, 1920 by 1080 so that it you know, looks decent. There you go. So just keep new configuration and I'm going to shut this down. Now, what we essentially want to do is install Linux Mint, right? So we double click this little icon here and it's going to start the installation process. So there you go, you pick your language. So whatever language you may be using, wherever you're located, I'm gonna pick English because that's what I want. Um, you pick your keyboard layout. Uh, uh, now this option, install multimedia codecs, I would highly recommend you take that because um, it basically allows YouTube videos and a whole lot of things to play in your browser, which won't play without this installed. You can install them later, but then it just becomes more tedious. So let's just take this now and then click continue. Now, here's the interesting thing. So if you already have Windows 10 on your computer or Windows 11, whatever, uh, Linux Mint will give you the option to install it alongside Windows. So you can have two operating systems on your computer. This, the first option basically keeps all your documents and uh, your, your music and all your files will remain on Windows as they are. The second option, uh, erase disk and install Linux Mint. Now this one is like the nuclear option where it'll destroy everything on your disk. So if you want to do this, what I would recommend is you click quit here, you restart your computer, go back into Windows, you back up all your uh, files and everything onto an external drive. And once you have that, you can come back here and then uh, proceed with erasing your disk and installing Linux Mint. But for now, let's just go with the first option because that's like safe. It lets you, you know, try out the operating system for a little while. Suppose I want to partition this. So let's say I want to give Linux Mint, say, 40 gigs or say 50 gigs, let's let's give it half the hard drive. So about 50 gigs, 50.1, it doesn't really matter, will be used by Linux Mint. And the rest of it, when it says files here, this is basically where your Windows currently resides, like where, where your Windows installation is. So if you've got, say, a one terabyte hard drive, you can maybe give like uh, 200, 300 gigs to Linux Mint and then uh, leave the rest for Windows. And then you just click install now. Now, depending upon where you're located, wherever your location may be, you click 
uh, your time zone. So this is basically just to set your time. And then my name. Well, my name is Biersch for sure. Uh, I don't think that's changed yet. And you can name your computer whatever you want. So I'm, I'm going to name this like uh, Linux Mint PC. You can call it whatever you want. It's your computer. Remember that. It is your computer. You have the choice. You can call it whatever you want. I'm just going to put in a generic password here. So it's going to require my password to log in. You can make it log in automatically if you want. But you can, I would just leave this to default and click continue. Let it install. Let it do its thing. And then uh, and once it's done installing, it's going to give you this little dialog saying um, installation has completed. And uh, whether you want to continue testing or you want to restart. So we're going to click restart now. And that's pretty much going to reboot your computer. And it's going to ask you to remove your installation medium and then press enter. So we're going to do that. So in your case, it's probably just unplugging your flash drive and then um, just clicking, just hitting enter. Pretty much it. And now when you start up your computer, you get the option to either just start Linux Mint. And hey, if you if you hit Windows 10 here, then you, you boot back into Windows 10. If you hit Linux Mint 21.3 Cinnamon, then that's that's where you're going to boot into. So now when you first start your uh, computer with the fresh with your fresh installation of Linux Mint, your Mint installation of Linux Mint, uh, this is probably what you're going to see. Now, the only thing that I've actually done separately here is um, install uh, OBS in order to capture the screen. Uh, this is I've. I use Fedora mainly on my system and I've just installed Linux Mint for this video. So I've got Fedora mounted here, which I can unmount if I want to. So if, if you plug in any kind of flash drive or anything, it's going to show up right here on your on your desktop. Now, uh, let's do the first few customization things that you need to do. So the first thing is desktop colors. Now here you can pick whatever color theme you want. So um, it's default it defaults to mixed which I don't exactly what like so I just usually hit dark and then uh, this little thing here um, it lets you pick the colors that your folders are gonna appear so your main desktop theme is like blue and then the folders are gonna be um, brownish so if I hit this one then everything's gonna be blue if I click uh, this one then everything's gonna be like sort of orangish with gray folders next thing is system snapshots now, um, so whenever you're trying to change any system settings, it's going to ask you for a password. So I'm just going to put in my password. Let's set aside the up update manager for now. I'll get to that in a bit too. So select snapshot type. Let's just stick to rsync. Don't, don't worry about it right now, what it's doing, what it's not doing. You don't have to worry about it. So the snapshot system, while this is loading, I'm just going to explain it real quick. It's, it's basically a way to uh, create... Um, backups of your computer so in case something goes wrong and your linux mint installation just breaks because of something or because of something you messed around with something went wrong um this is kind of a way to keep uh, backups of your system and restore your system to a working state so i just keep everything to the default so it's going to keep five daily snapshots um you don't have to really deal with this all that much um so when it says exclude home peers, so your home directory is where all your files go. So this here, this is your home directory. So your your downloads, your documents, your music, your pictures, and all of that, that's not by default going to be backed up by, uh, by time shift. So that's what we want. Then we click next, and then setup is complete. And this is your time shift uh, window. So when new snapshots are created for your system they're going to appear here so let's say we create one right now and there you go so you have a snapshot now for your system so in case something goes wrong with your system in any way you can just click restore and it's going to restore all your files back to what it was like not not your files basically your system so think of it like system restore in windows okay so time shift will keep backups of your system and uh, you don't really have to worry about your system breaking at any point. Now let's launch the uh, driver manager. So the driver manager is typically used to manage all drivers on your computer. So unlike Windows where you have to, you know, download drivers if you want to update them. So like if you've got an NVIDIA card, you probably go to NVIDIA.com or whatever and you just download your drivers and install them. 
So in my case, I don't need any drivers because I'm using an AMD uh, graphics card. So I have an AMD Radeon RX 6700. If you don't know what that is, just never mind. Um, if you have an NVIDIA graphics card, so some uh, laptops and computers come with an NVIDIA graphics card, then um, this place is where your NVIDIA graphics card drivers will show up. The only thing you have to do is click on it and click install. You're, you're going to have an install button and it's going to ask you to restart your computer and that's pretty much it. You don't have to worry about them anymore. The update manager is typically where you get your updates. All right, so I'd minimized this earlier. So you can even click on this little shield icon at the bottom, which gives you, you know, your update manager. Um, the update manager is kind of like Windows Update, except this one is relatively simpler to use. Now, uh, the first thing it probably pops up here is, do you want to switch to a local mirror? So they're usually faster and whatnot. So you can either click yes, um, again, you're going to need your password, the password that you use to log in. So uh, mirrors are basically where are your updates being downloaded from. So they are copies of your updates which are stored in servers globally. If you don't want to change this, you don't have to. So you can just leave it as is and you're pretty much fine. Click install updates and it's just, uh, it's just going to update everything. So. Linux is a little more cautious when it comes to, uh, Linux Mint, I'm uh, sorry, is a little more cautious uh, when it comes to installing updates. So like if it's trying to make very significant changes to your system, which can potentially break your system, like your kernel, for example, you don't, if you don't know what a kernel is, just let it go, it's fine, don't worry about it. Um, but if it's trying to make very, very critical system changes, then it's gonna tell you here, it's gonna give you this little warning that, hey, there are gonna be additional changes. 99% of the cases, nothing's gonna break. And now, now again, these are system updates, so you're gonna need administrator privileges, like what, the, like the UAC prompt in Windows. So you just gotta type your password, you know, that's pretty much it. It's gonna download your updates and install them, that's, that's it. Now, most updates, they don't really require you to reboot your computer, but sometimes you may have to, uh, because some updates are very critical, like the way we did our kernel update. So then it's gonna ask you to reboot your computer. You don't have to reboot right now. It's entirely your choice when you wanna do it. Now that we are back from our reboot, um, if you notice, uh, you still see that shield icon. If you click on it, it says your system is up to date. Now, there is also a way to auto update your computer. So you can do apply updates automatically, which means that, so it's it's an opt-in feature. So it's like, if you want your system to be updated automatically, you can just click on that and your system will update automatically. Now you're gonna have to put in your password because well, it's, it's a critical system change. You don't have to deal with any of this in general. So yeah, don't don't worry about it. If you if you're okay downloading updates manually, then um, just click on the shield once in a while and install all your updates. Oh, um, while we were installing updates uh, some time ago, it even detected my printer. Now, uh, printers in general, like this specific printer that I've got in general, is very tedious to get working on Windows with like a whole bunch of drivers because this is not even connected to my computer it's actually connected to the network. So it's, it's, on my, um, it's on my local network. So it's connected via Wi-Fi to my router and um, it's just, just works. All right, so getting back to applications. Now, typically for Windows, you'd, the way you would normally install an application is you would look for the application on say, um, in your web browser. Now Firefox is, what comes on uh, Linux by default. So you get the Firefox browser. Uh, you can install a different browser if you want. Uh, so let's say you want to install Chrome. So the typical way you do it is you go to Chrome and then you click on Google Chrome browser. Uh, so like say, I, I don't like to click on the first link because it's sponsored. And let's not get into it. Then you click on download Chrome. Now, okay, so when you say get Chrome for Linux, when you say Linux, it can mean a whole lot of things, right? So there are certain families of operating systems. Now, this is where things can get a little complicated, but once you know what family you belong to, it's pretty easy. So Debian, Ubuntu, Linux Mint, all of these fall within the Debian family or the Deb family. So that's where you do 64-bit Deb. So no matter what application you're installing, if it's a Deb 
if, if, if it gives you an option between RPM and Deb, you need to deal with Deb. Now, you notice I also use Fedora as my main operating system that uses RPM. Now that's a different family. So I'm using two different families of operating systems on my computer right now, right? That is the same way, like if you're using a Mac, you use a .dmg file. If you're using Windows, you use a .exe file, right? So this is one way to do it, but I wouldn't recommend you do that. Just don't worry about all of this. The proper way to do things in a Linux system is you go to Software Manager, which is like a app store of sorts. So like the way you install applications on your phone or on say your iPad or something, that's kind of the same way you deal with things here. So you've got your, you've got your whole application store. So let's say I want to install Chrome. So I just type in Chrome. I look for it. I see Google Chrome. Now um, you'll notice that Google Chrome, it says flat pack. I'll, I'll get to that in a bit, but this is how you install Chrome. So you just click install and then it says, yeah, it's going to install a few additional things that it may need. And then you click continue and it's going to install the whole package. Now, while you don't really have to wait for it to install, it's just going to keep installing in the background. Um, meanwhile, you can install other things if you need. So like, suppose you do a lot of Zoom conferencing, you can click on Zoom, you can click on install and then boom, you've got Zoom, right? It's nice and easy. So there's no, you, you think you'd use, uh, you, you need to use VLC for playing your videos. You don't really have to. Um, there is a perfectly fine video player in um, Linux Mint. But if you think you need it, you can just click install here. Now applications are delivered as packages in uh, most Linux operating systems. So like we talked about Deb, that is one way of packaging applications. Uh, Flatpak is another way of, app of packaging applications. The only significant difference between Flatpak and Deb for you, I mean, for most users is that uh, Flatpak is universal. It can work on any Linux operating system. Uh, whereas, uh, you know, Debs, RPMs are more limited to certain families, right? So that's all you pretty much need to know. However, if there is a flat pack version of an application available, then um, you could probably go for that. It usually has fewer issues, except for one exception. There is an exception to that. So if you're, do, if you're dealing with Steam, so let's say you want to play games, right? You want to install Steam. So uh, for Steam, there is a flat pack or flat hub option available. However, I don't recommend this. I would recommend you just install the system package that's Steam, which is a dev file. And you just, only thing you need to do is just go click, look for Steam, click Steam, and then click continue. And uh, yeah, it's gonna ask you for your password. You type in your password and it'll install Steam for you. Now that we have Steam installed, so uh, so I'm just gonna I'm just gonna cover the gaming use cases. So let's say you want to play some games, you click on Steam, you've got it installed and everything. So I'm gonna open Steam and I'm gonna log into my account and I'm gonna show you what that's like. And that's it. Uh, you you have your Steam. I just logged into my account just to show you. So you get your entire Steam library on the left here. Now, uh, there are a few caveats. Initially, it's only going to show you games that run on Linux. Now, if you want to also play games that are typically made for Windows and which are not tested or anything, so uh, what you gotta do is just go into settings, uh, go into compatibility, then click on, so this is typically enabled, enable Steam Play for supported titles. That means compatibility tools which uh, are required for um, Steam to run Windows games on Linux, right? But there are certain games which haven't been tested yet, but they typically still work. So you just gotta click this, and then it's gonna ask you to restart Steam. So yeah, you just you just do your restart Steam, and you're pretty much good to go. That's it. So you basically see all your games here, regardless of whatever they are. So if there's anything you want to play, you can pretty much just install it and play it. Like, um, I've been playing a lot of Cyberpunk. Um, so what I'll do is I'll show you my main Fedora install later on, and um, I can actually show you games running on Linux, and that will probably give you a better idea as to what that looks like. Now, moving on, if you've got games on the Epic Store or you've got games on, say, GOG, right? So in that case, you can't use Steam, right? So 
There is a application called uh, Heroic Games Launcher, which deals with um, Epic, GOG, and um, Amazon games. Again, all you gotta do is click install, and it's gonna install the whole thing. And uh, let's see, let, let, let's wait for it to install. And now once it's installed, I just click on launch. And there it goes. You, you have your Heroic Games Launcher. And um, well, right now it's gonna empty, but all you basically have to do is give it your Epic Games and your GOG logins. And uh, so it's just gonna, load you up with the website, you put in your information and it's gonna populate your library. So I'm just gonna sign in real quick. And once it's logged in, there you go, boom, you've got your whole uh, freaking uh, Epic Games library here. So let's say you wanna install something, you say you wanna install um, Batman or Axiom Verge or whatever it is you wanna install. So you click on that, you click install and it's basically just gonna install the game and you play it, right? Okay, so now, um, I mentioned earlier that you know you don't get Minesweeper in in some of my previous videos. You don't you don't really get Minesweeper on uh, Windows, which is free anymore. So let's say you want Minesweeper. Uh, well, you got a bunch of options here. So um, K Mines is actually a decent version of Minesweeper, but uh, personally I like. Uh, so there's Gnome Mines, which is quite nice too. I've heard of Mine Sector, but I haven't actually played Mine Sector ever. But no mines? Yeah, it's pretty good. Uh, so it's game mines. So you could just install, say, uh, one of these. Let's install game mines. Just, you know, just try any one of these. And hey, what do you know? You got your uh, minesweeper, clone, whatever this may be. So you got, uh, yeah. I mean, this is minesweeper like I remember it. And this is how I play minesweeper now. So, you know, if you if you ever feel like, you know, you're missing out on Minesweeper and uh, you really want to play it, well, on Linux it's still free. The settings pane in uh, Linux Mint is quite well laid out. So you've got your categories and uh, you can change all kinds of things. So I've got two displays attached right now. So um, I've basically set these to, you know, whatever resolution or refresh rate they support. You can change things around here if you really need to. It also supports uh, touch, like so, so. Suppose you have a touch screen and you have a stylus to go with it. Um, it supports that as well. So I don't. I'm on a desktop, so I don't have anything of the sort. So, uh, but I have tested this functionality on another laptop, which does have a stylus support. So it does work really well with something like Krita or um, you know, uh, Inkscape or something of the sort which is kind of a uh, segue into say, if you're a graphics editor, graphics tools, so you need to do say vector graphics, designing and things like that. So I think in uh, one of my previous videos, I'd mentioned that you've got Inkscape and you've got Krita, right? So back to the software store. So let's go back there and um, say, I want to do Krita. All I really have to do is type in Krita, click on this uh, first option, flat hub is fine. And just click install and that's it and there you go you have Krita. so i'm personally not a um not a graphics designer of any sort so i don't know how to use it but i do know people who do use it i'm i've been told it's a really really nice tool for you know um drawing and stuff uh if you want vector graphics then i think um the more popular tool is inkscape so in that situation you do pretty much the same thing you look for Inkscape, you click on, well, you can click on any one of these, but um, typically I would go for the flat pack version. So you just click on that, click on install, continue, and uh, it'll install the whole package for you in a matter of like a few seconds. Yeah, I, again, like this, I'm, I'm not a vector graphics designing guy or whatever. So I have no idea how good this is. I'm not the right person to ask, but Again, I know people who are uh, using Inkscape professionally as um, for for their work and stuff, and it's actually a, I've heard it's, it's it's a pretty good tool. Now, one of the things I'd mentioned uh, with Windows is the taskbar, which you can't move around. So, with Linux, uh, with most Linux operating systems, you do have that option. So, I can move it to the left of my screen, which is where I typically like my taskbar to be. 
or you know i can basically move it wherever i want i can modify it so um i can add um let me see where is it panel edit panel settings yeah so you can change like the height of the panel you want to make it larger you can make it larger if you like it that way so yeah it's you have a whole lot of options here so um you could change what applets there are so this here is an applet an applet is basically like a little um add-on to your taskbar so uh you being able to view your um open applications is essentially part of you know the taskbar so that is an applet in itself so you do have a bunch of options here which you can add and you can look into it if you want and you can edit things here I personally don't bother doing any of this. Just it's fine as as it is in the default. Now, if you're an Office user, um, it doesn't have Microsoft Office, but it does come with LibreOffice by default. LibreOffice is not maybe as good as Microsoft Office, but it gets the job done, and it's a lot better than you actually think. So, for example, if you're used to the uh, the tabbed interface then that typically Microsoft Office uses, you can click on, you can change the interface for this and then uh, make it, you know, like the tabbed layout. You get all these tabs to do things. Sure, it looks a bit dated. It's not, it's not exactly great looking, but it works. It gets its job done. There are a bunch of other Office tools available. So there's one which uh, I have a few of my colleagues using. It's called only office. Um, yeah, there you go. Only office desktop editors. Let's say I want to do a document. So it kind of looks very uh, similar to Microsoft office. So if you're used to Microsoft office, you might actually feel right at home here. So I'm just going to move this thing here. Presentation thing is also pretty similar. So th this is, I think like their, their PowerPoint equivalent. Uh, you also have your spreadsheets, which is your Excel equivalent, so which actually even looks a lot like Excel. So you have this. So I know a lot of people who use this, and they say it's actually pretty good and it works perfectly fine as a replacement for you know Microsoft uh, Office. Hey, if if you if you think this works for you, that's that's great. So if you've noticed, typically for most even for most advanced tasks, you don't need the terminal. Now there is a terminal here. You can use that if you want, but it's not really required i mean uh for whatever time that i did use linux mint i personally did not find that i had to rely on the terminal for most things but yeah that's that's pretty much it for linux mint i'll, I'll give you a brief um a uh, brief demo of what my system looks like using fedora and um see if you like that now this is my personal desktop uh using fedora so I'm using Fedora KDE to run things. Now, um, I did say I would show you how games work on this. So let's get into that. Now, since this is my main uh, operating system, I've got a bunch of games already installed. So um, let's, let's try Cyberpunk. There you go. Just, yeah, it just works. And it's, I don't really have a very powerful system, so this is a um, AMD Ryzen 5 3600, 32 gigs of RAM, and um, I've got a AMD Radeon RX 6700. So, I mean, sure, yeah, it's it's a bit stuttery because of well, the graphics card kind of so. Also, I think I may have you know amped up the graphics a lot for uh, you know testing and. I was I was messing around a whole lot with a lot of this, so yeah, I can probably reduce the graphics at some point and get higher FPS. You see on the top right. Let me see what I've done here. Pretty sure I did something stupid. Res I, oh yeah, there you go. So I don't even have resolution scaling working. So typically I'll use like um, AMD FSR uh, two point one or something, and I'll probably set it to quality. Quality usually works fine, and then. Um, I play on that and you, you I usually get a lot better um, frame rate on this but yeah I'm gonna have to tweak my settings a little this is and plus I'm recording at the same time so it's pretty much hammering my system so yeah I've been recording and playing cyberpunk that's 
That's nasty. Quite nasty. Oh, yeah. There's that. But, yeah. Um, it works. Now, you also have uh, Lutris. So, Lutris is a tool which allows you to essentially run Windows games on uh, Linux. So, suppose you don't have your game on Steam, or you don't have it on Epic, or GOG, or anything of the sort, then you can use Lutris to install... Uh, say like the EA Store or Ubisoft Connect or things like that. So you you probably have it on Ubisoft or Uplay or something. Works perfectly for that. So let's say you want to install some very specific game. So say you want to install uh you have say the disc version of San Andreas like from back in the day and you want to install that on your computer. You you can literally just do that. So you can click on this and it's gonna give you options on how you want to install it so this is the dvd plus mods so this is the dvd version of the game which you can install so if you have a disk drive you can pop your disk in and it's gonna help you do that uh it's also giving you options for emulation so sony playstation 2 and 3 i haven't tried these so i have no idea how, if they work or they don't but yeah you can pretty much do that with any game um right what red alert 2 say you want that yeah, there you go. So you click on Command and Conquer Red Alert 2. What version is it that you have? So you have the origin version maybe, and then it's gonna ask you where you wanna install it. And uh, it's gonna basically do everything that is required for the game to run, and it's gonna add an entry right here. And that's it, you just double click the entry and it runs. Now, uh, since this is Fedora KDE, this is not Linux Mint. The App Store on this looks a little bit different. But in essence, it's pretty much the same. So um, as I was pointing out, you know, there, there are a whole lot of Linux-based operating systems out there. The only reason I use uh, Fedora is for my work or, or whatever I have to do. Um, Fedora works a lot better for me than Linux Mint does. So uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. Oh yeah, also for video editing. So what I use is uh, Kaden Live. So you, you do have Kaden Live for, so this is what I use for most of my editing. For certain video editing uh, needs that Kaden Live does not fulfill, I use DaVinci Resolve. Now DaVinci Resolve is again an industry standard uh, video, video editing tools. So this is typically the tool which you would find uh, used for Marvel movies or, uh, you know, Hollywood big, big production houses, right? So yeah, you have that. Thank you everyone for watching. If you liked this video, hit like. Let me know down in the comments if I've missed anything or if you have any use cases for Linux Mint and how you use your computer and you use Linux on your computer for whatever you have to get done. If you enjoy content like this, make sure to get subscribed so you get a notification every time I put out a new video. And until then, I'll see you guys in the next one.